Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the reissue, yay, of Inbal's Mahler Cycle, Eliyahu Inbal on Denon. Now, you know, Inbal is an interesting conductor. He has basically made a career doing three composers. I mean, he's done a lot more than that, of course. But the ones that are really sort of like he developed a reputation for was, were, were, there are more than one, yes, Bruckner, um, where he did like all the original versions of the symphonies with versions, thus opening Pandora's box of Bruckner version hell. Um, and then he did, he did the complete Mahler cycle. And then he did a major collection of Berlioz recordings as well. And these were all, well, the, Ber the Bruckner was on Teldeck, which is now Warner. And the other two, the Mahler and the Berlioz, were on Denon. And so they had kind of patchy circulation here in the West, and they were a little bit pricey. Um, and they were, you know, early digital recordings, but early digital recordings by a label that knew how to make digital recordings for the most part. And so they were really pretty cool. The Mahler cycle is one of the best out there. It's an excellent, excellent Mahler cycle. It has a few quirks, which we will get to momentarily. But the bottom line is that this includes Das Lied von der Erde and the complete performing version of the 10th. And it has no real weak spots. I mean, you'll like some more than other. There are some others. Some performances are stronger than others. But essentially, they are really, really good. He, he gets Mahler's style, hands down, and he's recorded He's recorded them over and over again. He's done another cycle with the Tokyo Metropolitan Symphony, which is available for ridiculously high prices. Um, so I don't suggest anybody needs to bother with it. I mean, some of them may be a little better. Some of them sound a little better, but, you know, why? Life is too short, right? And, and you know, and he's done Mahler in other places too. So he he's one of the great Mahler conductors, not because he's done a lot, but just because he is. I mean, he really really gets Mahler. And you can tell from these performances right away. Now, I remember, I remember very, very vividly when the first symphony came out, how excited I was just by the sonics. They were so crystal clear. You know, the, the Frankfurt Radio Symphony, which is the operative ensemble here, um, recorded in like a barn in Frankfurt, a large acoustic space, um, which meant that there were issues with things like the organ was always too small sounding and some other things like that. But basically, basically, Denon got a really, really clean, full sound, which was wonderful. The peculiar thing about this first symphony, though, is that the entire second Timothy part in the finale is missing. I have no idea what was going on with that performance. They just don't play it. Or maybe the guy was like out to lunch <laughs> or had an emergency, you know, but there's no second Timothy part. And it matters because they're, they're going back and forth constantly throughout the finale and they don't, there's only a fourth, there's no back. So that was really, really weird, but it's a wonderful performance. I mean, the performance was great. I just remember hearing it going like, where is that? What is going on? Okay, so that was like the weirdness. Then things sort of went all, all got in shape from there. The, the uh, second symphony is very, very good. A powerful performance. Like I said, the, the very ending could use a little more like bass and weight and amplitude. You know what I mean? But the interpretation is, is, is marvelous. It's kind of like Bernstein without what some people consider to be Bernstein's excess, which is actually just doing what Mahler wrote. But it, it has that, that emotionality, the, the immediacy, the impulsiveness, the willingness to, to you know, create atmosphere and let the music really sink in, you know? Oh, it's just wonderful. The first movement is terrific. And the orchestra plays really, really splendidly. The third is one of the great performances, the third. It's remarkable. I mean, the first movement is just great. Oh my goodness. It's terrific. And, and it has no dead spots at all. It's very, very well done. And and it, it just continues that way all the way up through the very, very beautiful account of the finale. The fourth is exquisite. Um, I think, who's the, uh, Helen Donat is the soloist. Let me make sure here. I'm sure the booklet is like totally in Japanese, which means I won't be able to figure out anything. No, it's all in Japanese. No, it has, it does have some English here. 
Um, that's good. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I mean, she's really great. The Adagio is gorgeous. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance full of chamber music like, you know, delicacy and balance. And it's just wonderful. The fifth is one of the best fifths out there. That's the symphony that everybody screws up. But Inval does it. He does an amazing job with it. The brass playing is tremendous. Uh, my colleague, Victor Carr, um, when he reviewed the, the, the brilliant classics reissue of these performances, um, found the adagietto to be a little bit, a little bit on the, he said, chaste. And it is, it's a little chaste. It doesn't have to sweat that much, does it? And then the finale is terrific. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, really good, smart, well-paced Mahler fifth. Sixth, no complaints. No complaints at all. It's, it could be maybe a little spookier. So that's a complaint. A little spookier in the finale, just a little bit. But it's it's wonderfully well played, and he gets all of those Mahlerian sounds, you know, the cowbells, the thingies that are going on, and you know, tam tams, and you, know, you hear it all. It's all there. It's so cool. So it is with the seventh. Um, it has a really good finale, uh, which is rare. The seventh, um, the eighth is always tricky because you've got so many people doing so many things. Here, it would be nice if there was like more organ and sort of weight in the sound, but no complaints about the pacing, no complaints about the singing. It's a terrific eighth. Nine is beautiful. I mean, you know, it just keeps going like that, right? It really does. The ninth, the ninth has some amazingly clear string playing in the first movement. You really hear that, you know, that, you know, that sort of, <clears throat> that, gnarly contrapuntal string interlude in the first movement based on the second subject, you know, do 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 of melodic phrases and clarity that you don't hear in any other performance. It's just lovely, a terrific ninth. He does the complete tenth. Um, it, it's good. Uh, you know, the complete tenth is always an issue, right? Because it's it still sounds, even with Derek Cook's completion, rather rather bony. And I think the, the early digital recording here makes it sound a little bit sparser and bonier than it otherwise might. Um, so, you know, that's up to you. And the, let's see, Dusselit van der Erde has Yard van Ness is the, is the contralto, and she's a very good contralto, and, uh, or mezzo-soprano, whatever you want to call her. Who's, who's the tenor? It's not Peter Schreier, is it? It's, it's, yes, it's Peter Schreier, who does it constantly. Um, I don't think he's the best tenor for Dusselit van der Erde. I mean, he's a leader singer. He's not really a Heldon tenor. Um, and, uh, but the orchestration is, is, is well caught. And the singing's very nice. And like I said, it's just it's just real Mahler stuff. So, and here's the thing. Here's the real kicker. This whole box of all this stuff runs about 68 bucks on Amazon. Um, and so with all these CDs, it's 15 CDs, which is a deal. Some of these individually cost 68 bucks on Amazon or more or 30 something or 40 something. I mean, the prices of this Japanese imported stuff is, you know, they're just crazy. They're ridiculous. You might get them better from Japanese import sources in Japan. But, uh, you know, when you look this stuff up, it's, it's just stupid. So you might as well get the whole box while you can, and you'll have one of the great Mahler cycles out there. And it's one of the least acknowledged of the great Mahler cycles out there, because when this came out, you know, I mean, Mahler was, it was the Mahler thing, and everybody was doing it. And, and, you know, you compare this to people like Claudio Abbato, who people rave about with his Lucerne Mahlers and this and that. It's just no comparison. This is like 30 trillion times better. It really is. It, 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 it's just so much more idiomatic and, and unfussy and emotionally direct and powerful. And, you know, there, there was so many other versions. And since this, of course, there's been like a billion other Mahler cycles. But this one still holds its own really, really well. So if you are a Mahler person and you haven't been able to get this, or you've been driving yourself crazy looking at the prices of these individual discs, go for it. Even with the missing timpani part, the finale of number one, it's a great Mahler cycle. It's that simple. 
really, really first class. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.